Latanya Richardson Jackson, how did you get your role on Grey's Anatomy as Maggie's mother, Diane Pierce? It was a gift from the gods, the Shondaland God. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I got a call from um, my agents and I, I pretty much sure that Shonda uh, gave me the job. Um, she has become um, an important person in my life. She's an important person in all of our lives, but I'm glad to have her friendship and acquaintance now. And I know that she knew that I, I really love the show. And if something ever came up, I know that I've been so blessed to have people who are in the business who just say, you know, I know when the right thing comes along, I'll just call you about it. So that's pretty much what happened. Okay. And when you took on the role, did you know that it was for three episodes, that there would be kind of several episodes in between your first and second appearance, and also that your third episode would be kind of entirely about your character? Not at all. <laughs> the, <laughs> the thing about working in Shondaland that I found, which is an incredible place to work. It really is a land. It's like Disneyland. It's, it's, it's a universe in, on, unto itself. But the way they operate, you don't know from script to script what the arc is. And I found out from talking to the regular team of actors who are there, who are in, you know, sort of repertoire in, um, as the regular cast mates, that they don't know either. That they go from script to script in a season, not exactly knowing and becoming shocked sometime at, as they do the read, the table read, at what's actually happening to their character. So no, I had no idea. I knew I was coming on as, first of all, I'm a fan of the show from the very beginning. So. I knew the characters, I knew who they were, and, and Kelly McCreary, um, to get to play her mom was incredible, but I figured from all of the other mothers, I didn't know. All I said was, well, the rest of those mothers have expired. <laughs> so let's just go script to script and don't ask any questions. I'm just happy to be in the service. Now, I feel like you're always working, you know, you have a steady stream of work, uh, but I feel like you've been doing a fair amount of press for this role, even after your arc has ended. So what is it about this character that you feel uh, makes you want to get the word out? You know, this character resonated with so many people that I have been doing, you know what, an inordinate amount of press because I keep saying they want to what? Who wants to talk to me about what? They want to talk to you about the role. So many people have called Grays and called my agents and publicists to say, could, could we get an interview with her? Um, I think it touches us on such a human level because thematically what it dealt with and how it dealt with so many of us are going through or have gone through or have been touched by it. This cancer epidemic in the world, you know, is the scourge of our existence. And I think that some people somewhere have, can relate to it on that level. So emotionally, it was an episode, all of the episodes became so relatable that somehow in the zeitgeist, it, it just took hold and I don't know. It just, I don't know, Riley. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> You're talking to me. <laughs> yeah. And when you come into a show that's in like season 13, uh, are you just focusing on your own scenes or are you trying to stay aware of everything that's happening in your episodes, even if you haven't seen the ones around them? Oh no, darling. All actors are very selfish. You're only dealing with yourself and how many lines you have. No, Really, I, I couldn't afford, you know, coming in. When you are a guest star on a show, well, it's in my opinion, you really can't afford to, to deal with too much in the world around you. You have to stay focused on the moments that you are engaged in with the actors, because first of all, they're there in a continuum. They're there all the time. So their rhythm 
is pretty much set kind of. And so I think, especially for me, I was trying to sit in the middle of their rhythm so that a, I didn't cause any problems so that we could just keep moving because they're used to moving very quickly. And so my world only existed in terms of Diane Pierce and the association that she had with all of the other actors that she talked to, touched, knew about, had heard about what they said about her, what she said about them. That was my world. So everything else I was oblivious to. Now, a big part of Maggie's arc is that, you know, she was searching for her birth parents. And then when you finally come on, I, I believe in the first couple episodes that you're in, there's no reference to how uh, Maggie was adopted by your character. Was that something that you discussed with uh, Kelly McCreary to kind of establish the rapport between your characters? You know, it was so amazing. Truthfully, I hope you get to talk to her because we ended up having the same story. I had never talked to her about a story. So when I came in because of the way I work, I had to create a history for myself, which I had not been given. And I know that from the episodes that preceded her coming on the show, they didn't really talk about you know her, Maggie or who she was or, or, or who her mother was. So I told her, okay, look, uh, I'm a, I, I run a school a charter school. Uh, I've been a teacher. I've been a principal, a headmaster. And uh, now I, and she said, that's what I have in my history. We had done the same history without uh, unawares. We, I didn't know that that's what she had created for her mom, but that's what I had created for her. So we talked about a couple of things that we could like, you know, add to it to, so that we could relate and be on the same page. But let me just say these writers on, on these episodes are so good that they helped you historically to know where your footing was. They gave it to us. So all we had to do was do the roadmap and you know, sort of infuse it with its blood because they gave us the figures. They, they figured it out for us because they're really, they have great writers on this show. You mentioned the writers. Uh, can you actually talk about the director of your last episode, which was uh, Ellen Pompeo in her directorial debut? What differentiates the choices that she makes uh, in that role? You know, that's a question for her. I just know that working with her was a dream. She's good. She has, she has the eye. It may have been the first time that she got to do it, but if she wants to continue in that vein, she can do it because there are certain things that I have noticed about good directors. It's their attention to minutia and detail. And she's so detail oriented. You can see it in her work though as well, but in directing, she cared whether or not your eyelash fluttered at a certain time. You know what I mean? She was, she was on it like that between, so between her, and having the benefit of uh, Debbie Allen standing there with her to help her, you know, producing through it, it was for me an easier job than someone who might have been green or didn't possibly know what they were doing. Innately, she knows what she's doing and she showed up. She did the homework because you can't just look, pick up a script and say, okay, I'm directing. There has to be some homework and some work done with that. So I applauded her for that because she was really, she is really good at this. And if she wants to be a director, she can. And in your last scene, uh, you finally got to meet kind of the character of your ex-husband played by Richard Lawson. Uh, but unfortunately by then your character is already dead and just kind of lying in the hospital. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, so did you, uh, were you disappointed by that? Did you talk with him at all? Uh, you know, I know Richard very well. We're friends. So I keep telling him that I have great hopes for us in the future of me in a flashback. <laughs> because <laughs> I said, because as long as you are alive, then there's hope for Diane to return in some incarnation, in my opinion. Um, I think that 
the story of her having these two fathers may bode well for some future episodes, even the, the interaction between uh, Richard and Jim, Dr. Weber and the father and Maggie's father, Richard Lawson. I think that there's a lot there to be mined. I just keep trying to insert myself into it again because I had such a great time there and I was very sad to have to die and leave. Uh, now I wanted to ask about your real husband, uh, Samuel L. Jackson. So you guys have not worked together that we've seen in eight years. Is that a conscious decision? Yes. <laughs> um, we try to separate, you know, I did a film with him, Freedom Land. We used to work together all the time when we were young, when we were really growing up and it was like, at, we were sort of on the same level. But since his, you know, star rose so high and he became a supernova, um, <laughs> we have not found ourselves able to, to work together. I don't, you know, I, I don't, make a conscientious effort to try to go and assume myself into any of his films. And um, I mean, the, the theater, which you know is my first love, he, he still wants to do that, but he just never ha has time. Conscientiously, we unconsciously, conscientiously have or don't work together. Uh, the last time I did, he had such a huge trailer and so many amenities that were not afforded to me. I said, oh, well, I guess we won't be doing this again because I can't take it. Um, but I think in the future, if I would love to do a play with him, but a film, eh, you know, I like doing what I do. I like coming in, hitting it and leave. I have no um, designs nor have I ever had on being famous. And I think that people who are, that that's sort of in the kind of, I don't know, situation that they perpetuate. And I just, I, I just don't have that. I, I love art. I love the work. I love the people who create it. I am so in awe of opportunity and just living every day and being able to jump in and jump out of these spectacular situations that are mostly unorthodox for me in terms of a career. So I look at my career like that. I don't even think of it as a career. It's like, okay, am I working or am I not working? You know, um, he's a machine, you know what I mean? With his talent, he has this whole business thing that's that's so big that I'm like, oh no, I'm too lazy for that. I can't, I don't, I don't want to go and do this. I don't want to stand on the red carpet. I don't want to, you know, it's, I don't want to, I don't want to, I just want to work. I just want to, to look at the work and be a part of it, to jump in and say, oh God, let me live with this. Let me, let me do that. So, you know, I'm not opposed to it. I don't turn down working with them. We just don't seek it out. You know what I mean? If it comes, we'll see. Yeah, and when I was looking through your filmography, like trying to identify that last time that you guys were working together, I noticed that you kind of work a lot more in drama, even though, like, as we see, so it's like when you first appear, you're very spry. It seems like you certainly have that skill set if you wanted to guest star in a sitcom, say. I, you know, I had a, I was on a sitcom when we first moved to LA called Franny's Turn. Uh, with Mariana Margulies that was an import from Britain that uh, CBS had. I I know, I think I'm pretty damn funny, but I just always end up in these heavyweight roles, you know? I just, I gravitate toward them, I guess. I guess. I like them, but there's always, I think, I hope, I don't think it's hubris for me to say so, but I, I think there's always a little something even in the drama that carries a little humor in what I do. I try to, because I don't think anybody's just all that weighted down with all that drama, except Mary J. Blige. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you don't want to be famous, uh, and you've been working for 
you know, almost three decades in film and television. And just a few years ago, you finally got some, I'd say, uh, major recognition when you picked up your Tony nomination for Arisen in the Sun. So can you speak to uh, that experience? I think that that's written on the resume of my soul. I will forever, all of the hallmarks that I get to do, I will forever hold Raisin, Grays, as something that was so spectacular and special that I know for a fact that it was a blessing of a gift from something bigger than me. That experience, you know, I've known Giselle too for a while, but when I say famous, I mean, I'm not, I, I have never really sought the spotlight that way. You know what I mean? I. I just never have. Um, I know a lot of people and I know a lot of people know me. And I, you know, I do a lot of coaching with kids and I always tell them if, and I know life has changed because I'm old and life has changed now, but you can't search, you can't search for the fame. You can't search for the spotlight. It has to always be about the work because the work is going to be what sustains you forever. It's always going to be the work if you're working for the work. So I don't want to say, I, I, I just know that I never said, oh, I'm going to do this and, and be famous. Oh, I'm going to do this and get an award. Never. And for a reason, I really, that really came out of left field because I was replacing someone, you know, during a very deep rehearsal period that was so quick that I had to go on so quickly that it never would have crossed my mind. Everybody who does theater though, you know, the Tonys are like, the Tonys, you know, that's, that's bigger to us than any Oscar. It's like the Tony Awards. Um, so you think about it, but you only think about it in the sense of who wouldn't want a Tony. But most theater people, theater actors, they never really work toward having something like that. So for me, Sophie Okaneda, Anika Noni Rose, you know, and, and my son Denzel, that was it. That was like the pinnacle of all I could have hoped for. It was manna from heaven and it was the most graciously best experience I could have possibly had or not thought of, because who would have thought? Who would have thought of that? Um, but it was a heady experience. It was a fun experience. And the nomination was so shocking to me, but so much fun. So I get to, for the rest of my life, say, oh no, I'm a Tony nominated actress. I'm a Tony nominated <laughs> actress. This is, this is like everybody keeps talking about now with this Grey's Anatomy. It does not, you know, I, I just don't think like that. I think that Grey's, I am so happy so many people saw it and were a, affected in some way by it. I, I think I, everywhere I go, somebody is saying, oh, I saw you on Grey's, I saw you. I said, yeah, it was about the writers and about those people that did that play. I mean, that wrote that script. I said, I should remember that name. Ugh. Anyway, I hope I answered your question. I do tend to go on. Oh, and after you got the nomination, uh, what surprised you about being on the award circuit? How much work it is. It's a lot of work and you're constantly being asked to do an interview, be here, show up, show up dressed, show up here, take the picture, go over here. And remember, we were still doing the play. So you have to do all that in the day, then go and do that play, that gut wrenching play in the, in the evening. So I was shocked a little that the circuit was, you know, so busy. Yeah. Okay. And finally, can you tell me what you have coming up next? Hmm. Well, you know, I did Rebel, and that's on with John Singleton, who's another friend that called, and I was happy to, to be able to, to work with him. And I have something that's a secret, so I can't talk about that. Um, but Marvel, you know, because I do Luke, Luke Cage. So... We're starting back up. <laughs> so we have our fingers crossed that I, I'm told that we're in it for another season. So 
Luke Cage is coming. And hopefully Scott Rudin or someone out there has a play that I can go and do because, you know, that's, <laughs> that's my love as well. Um, and like I said, we can always ghost back at Grays. Diane may be gone from the earth, but she's not gone from the stratosphere. She lives as an angel. And I think everyone wants to see that. Yeah, and Grey's Anatomy just keeps chugging along. That show, I feel like, will be on forever. <laughs> Do you believe that? Shonda said it will. <laughs> she says as yeah, long they, as she's there, Grey's is there. They just announced that Scandal's ending. So. <laughs> Who announced that? Really? It was just uh, today, actually. Yeah. Really? Next season will be the last one. Yeah. This season? Next season will be the last one. Yeah, season seven. Oh, my. I didn't know that. <laughs> Thanks, Riley. That's breaking news. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll have our fingers crossed for seeing you again on Grey's Anatomy. That Thank would you very be much. Wonderful. And to everyone who supported us through the arc of Diane Pierce, know that from my heart, I love you all. That Kelly McCreary, she's a major, major star. She just, she's a little machine. She really is that good. So. I just want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in and to all the people who are stopping me on the street to tell me that they saw it, even in the grocery store. Kisses. Love you. Mean it. Bye, Riley. Good luck with your show. I hope to talk to you again. Always call me when I'm doing something.